so let me introduce the speaker for today. Uh, today we are uh, fortunate to have uh, S. Govinda Krishna, more uh, like those close to him, call him uh, GK. So he is uh, a very experienced uh, engineer slash uh, engineering manager. And he has been coding since uh, 1987. Uh, he graduated from IIT Madras in 1985, and uh, his first job was uh, as a project engineer in Tata Projects uh, Limited, where he worked for three years. Subsequently, he joined as a software engineer in the Reliance Industries Limited, where he was uh, involved in maintenance of heavy equipment and inventory management. And his subsequent roles in other companies uh, were more software oriented. Finally, in 2005, uh, he joined uh, Tally, uh, where he worked uh, for more than eight years. When he left Tally in 2014, uh, he uh, he was a vice president. So you know, Tally is a very well known uh, product company, and a uh, lot of accountants in India and maybe in the Indian subcontinent use Tally. So uh, his role has been very uh, pivotal in the growth of Tally. Uh, and in 2014, he founded a, a startup called Samiksha. So the tagline for Samiksha is we help you create great technical teams. So to understand this tagline, uh, I remember he explained this to me once. You know, in a, any software team, you might have one or two geniuses. And these geniuses will consistently deliver results. But Samiksha is not about uh, you know welcoming these geniuses. It is about taking ordinary teams, ordinary engineers, and making them uh, uh, contributing people. Uh, how they can become great contributors. How they can be part of great teams. So that is what uh, Samiksha does. And uh, to put it simply, uh, an engineer has to do a number of things: thinking, coding, verifying, debugging, learning. So all these uh, are different activities that a software engineer gets involved with. So Samiksha and GK is actually a co uh, do the coaching for these developers so that they can be effective in all these daily tasks. So that is about Samiksha. And uh, one more thing uh, to mention is that uh, in 2018, he also in parallel became a CTO of DeepCell which is uh, about creating AI powered tools that identify and create sales opportunities. So with that uh, short introduction, I would now like to hand over to GK. Thank you, Arvind. Um, that's a very nice introduction. So uh, today's session will be uh, very heavily code oriented and um, I'm going to start by, you know, focusing not really on giving you all some gyan, gyan kind of things. Okay. What is the difference and this and that. Uh, we'll dive in with an example. Okay. It's in Python. So I hope most people will uh, understand that. Okay. And uh, in, in some sense, this is a learning experience for all, for me as well as you people. So I make, for example, certain assumptions of uh, how people tend to code based on my experience. Your experience may be different from mine. And if you if I say something, I if I say that you know most people will do something like this. Uh, if you disagree, please. Uh, let's discuss. Okay, uh, it's it will help me out so that when I give the message to other people, I under the more people I understand, the better it is for me, and the it will be more interesting if you people can interact. Okay, if you you can point out, hey, what you've done, there's a bug in this. The code. Uh, I'm not going to open a code editor. I've just uh, I have written code in a code editor and pasted it into PowerPoint, but it is working code. It's, it's not um, uh, just something which I've written. So let's start. So I will start with a very simple assignment. I will try to do this bottom up first, then I try to do it top down. And, and we'll, with that, we'll try to understand the difference that comes up. 
the assignment is very simple. It's an attendance system. A file with time in and time out is provided. More than seven hours full day attendance. More than four hours half day attendance. Above grade three, no minimum requirement for hours spent. Above grade three, no attendance striking required. For people in the sales department only, only first scan and last scan to be used. So what does this mean? Uh, if you're a tech person, you log in at uh, 10 o'clock, you go out at 12 o'clock and come at 6 o'clock. You will and I mean, come at 6 and leave at 7. You will only be given three hours. Whereas a salesperson, if he comes in at 7, goes out at 11, comes back in at 5 and leaves at 7, the whole 10 to 7 will be counted against him, right? Because salespeople go out and meet people, so it doesn't make sense to for But people whose work tends to be within the office, hey, if you go out, you are treated as not available, right? So that's that is the specifications which we have been given for our attendance system. So let's see, and this is a you know a, a sample text file. This, this is what you'll get. You'll get a semicolon and the uh, date, okay? And for each employee, whenever he swipes in or swipes out, timestamp is put. That's all. That's all that is there, right? It just has a timestamp saying that this person swiped at this time. Uh, very simple text file. So, what is the bottom up approach? And this is the approach that, you know, um, TDD kind of encourages, right? Where it says, take the smallest thing, uh, right? So, it's a red, then you go through a red, green refactor cycle. So, you write a test saying that I want. Uh, I want to do this. I, I will do this. So I want this result. And then the test will first fail. Then you write the code which makes that test pass. Then you look and see if you need to refactor. Okay. So, uh, and this is also the, you know, the agile approach also mm, doesn't openly encourage this. Uh, but in the real life and practically when people are working in a scrum, they just look at, okay, what's the problem I'm supposed to finish in this sprint, okay? And how can I complete this? So given this assignment, the typically, the first thing people will say, okay, uh, just read the daily file and extract the timestamps from it. Okay, then when you look at the requirement, okay, the first small component I'll build hmm, is a piece of code that reads the daily file and extract timestamp. If any of you think that, no, 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 this is not the first thing that comes to mind, I do something else, please uh, share it. What, what else was the first thing that would come to your mind if you were uh, uh, given this assignment? Okay, um, if nobody is saying anything, I assume that you are agreeing with it. So we will see uh, some kind of code like this, saying that okay, scan date is today's date, and I'll have a function called scan timestamp file, which takes scan date as a parameter, and it will return timestamp data. It returns data in a dictionary structure for a given scan date where it says employee ID and list of timestamps. That is, if I looked at this, it will look at E002, scan for other timestamps of E002, and make it a list, and against each employee, I have a list of timestamps. That, that's the first thing that comes to mind uh, when I'm tying up something like this, right? Uh, the next thing is to say, okay, Timestamps are fine, but actually I need durations. If I see the requirements, it is hours, how many hours kind of thing. So timestamp is not enough. I need to convert these timestamps to hours. Okay. So that's the next small component I'll build. Okay. And convert timestamps to duration, duration in office, and total time. Because 
for sales people uh, we have different criteria we are only looking at uh, total time that is uh, first time stamp to last time stamp for other people we are looking at duration in office where we are going to say okay first swipe next time that is a second swipe that's the duration is there if the third and fourth swipe he is <coughs> that is his balance time and that is total up okay so i have function maybe uh, maybe i made a class for all this that uh, we can consider but typically this kind of approach tends to look at it as uh, functions right they they write small functions and say okay if i have timestamp data which is employee id plus list of timestamp i want to convert it to employee duration data okay and so that takes employee id and total it will give return one more dictionary again employee id but instead of list of timestamps inside the dictionary there will be a dictionary which says what's the total duration and what's the in the office duration right again if i had given this assignment to most people this is the typical bottom up approach most people would take then yeah okay now we have durations now we have to calculate and update the attendance in the database so at this point people say okay we should have a class and we should have a employee class which does that so that all we need to do is iterate through this um, case uh, of uh, dictionary and create an employee object for each employee id and call update attendance which is obviously a method uh, against the employee uh, object and which passes in the scan date and what is the total duration in office and office duration for that person does this so i i like everybody's opinion on this does this looks like a nice clean design or would you do it differently and uh, you know i know there are very experienced people and and i do hope to have some interaction at least say yes i agree or no i don't agree yeah this is arvin here yeah it uh, looks okay on the, on the first attempt yeah. yeah 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 right uh, okay one one anyway. uh, one of my reasoning is that people uh, when they are given a data they will start from the data so right. scanning the file and getting it into the system seems the most logical step right to code first yeah yeah but anybody others may do it differently yeah right anybody else have any opinion about this approach this is this is a typical bottom up approach and most people would I agree with this approach, as Arvind said. Get the data into the system and then figure out how to do it. Anybody have an opinion? Either yes. I agree with Arvind and you. I think that's how I would go about this also. Just get right. it in first and then play around with it. I guess to see what's going right. on. This right. This is a very sequential approach, uh -huh. but can be thought of uh, in many different ways. Right. Yeah, it is very sequential, and mm, that is true. That's a valid. Uh, that's a very excellent point, actually, because when you build components and try to tie them together, hmm, uh, th this is the approach which people tend to do. They write uh, small functions, and most of the. I mean, if you look at the individual functions, they are not doing anything complicated. Yeah, this just doing some simple. processing and returning it right very sequential uh, and uh, what i'm saying is if somebody is given this task in their um, in a sprint hey boss uh, you are doing a payroll system and you assign somebody boss this uh, somebody is giving this text file we need to com uh, complete it and up update the uh, attendance for somebody a typical approach that you they will take okay and um let's here this is the employee class just uh, one more uh, point yeah 
just to add to what Ramanathan said about sequential approach. See, Ramanathan himself is a data scientist where he deals with uh, big data. Right. So he may be uh, coming from that perspective where suppose you have uh, 1 million employees or right. 10 million entries in that uh, day's record. Right. So you would do parallel processing, like chunk right. the data and then put it through multiple cores. So then the right. code will look very different. Yes, yes, yes. That is a, if you want to do parallel processing, that is an entirely different game. Let's assume that, you know, that the number of employees are only 20, right? And, and on a day, you don't expect uh, more than, you know, 100 or 150 records. Would, um, would that look, would that then look reasonable? We wouldn't need parallel process for that kind of data, especially in Python. And definitely in Python, it's hard. But yeah, that, that's a valid objection. Uh, so then we, you would have some uh, employee data. So what happens is when the employee is initialized, we need the grade and department because that is going to affect how the uh, calculation is done. And update data takes the date to update and the duration. Right? So the business rules are there if grade is less than three and department is sales, uh, use the total duration. Uh, if it is not sales and the grade is less than three, uh, use the in office duration. Uh, if grade is less than five, less than or equal to five, then uh, which is an else if for this, uh, if then as long as the person has come in and the total duration is more than zero, he gets full attendance. And if he's above grade five, his attendance is always marked as one. Doesn't matter whether he comes into office or not. Then we have a, a cursor execute, which updates the database, right? Uh, I would, if I was reviewing this code, I would say, look, you are, um, you know, putting a data access layer and mixing it with the business layer, at least make it out as a separate function so that, you know, I could isolate that. That is probably one comment I would make. But yeah, when people are very focused on this, the, the, I have seen code like this where, you know, the data access layer is getting mixed with the business layer, which, which is a typical uh, problem that we find. Not unusual to have this kind of problem. And that's what we get. So, uh, except for this, you know, data access layer getting mis mixed up with the business logic layer. Uh, people who review this would say, yeah, this is fine. This, this looks okay. Any comments would, uh, apart from this data access layer problem, mm -hmm. does anybody else find any issues with this? Okay. So I assume that, yeah, th th this is this is typical code that you see. Now let's, Look at what is the top down approach. As, as we saw, the bottom up approach takes says build small components and tie them together. That, that's a fundamental way the bottom up design is done. You, you try to make small components and tie them together. The top down approach is different. It says break the problem into parts, then break the parts into parts, repeat until each part is easy to do okay this, this is the top down approach so uh, what i encourage people when they want to uh, do a top down approach is very straightforward write down the problem you're trying to solve break the problem into parts so first write down at the topmost level it's it's a you know hierarchical level first at the topmost level write down what you're trying to do so Update attendance information for employees for working days. When you start writing down the problem and don't look at it bottom up, certain questions uh, start bubbling up. 
shouldn't be running this for all days, every day. Um, does that assume that um, when I'm running it, uh, it'll be run? because the bottom up people say, okay, whenever I get today's, whenever I get the file, I will process it immediately. So I will look for today's data and process it. Okay. So um, now another, when you try to put down this sentence and you think, what exactly am I doing, right? Then you start thinking, you know, we should be doing it for working days. Uh, and yeah, we should have a working days list so that, you know, I only process for working days. If somebody is uh, logging in on a non-working day on a Sunday, why should I mark his attendance on those days? I, I should not be marking attendance on Saturday and Sunday. Only on working days, I, I should be doing this. So when you take the top down, top down approach, writing down the problem statement which you are trying to solve as a sentence helps. Then break the parts into parts, okay? So what are the three parts which come to mind for something like this? Get employee information, get um, working dates, and update the attendance information, saying that I don't know yet how attendance information um, needs to be done, but these are the three things um, that need to be done. So I write code which more or less matches this structure. The structure of the code that I write matches the top down design statements I made. These are um, what, what I call as how to statements, right? I write down uh, what are the things I have to do and how I'm going to do it. So I, I will update attendance information. This uh, for I will uh, this is how I'm going to solve the problem that you have said. Get employee information. Get working days. So I have uh, just say get employee information. Okay, I get a collection of employee objects. So get all current employees. Okay, I'm not going to show this code of how get all current employees works, but uh, but let's just assume. If they will write a function like this. It, it is the same thing. I, I'm just writing one small piece of code. But the thing is, what is driving what function I will write is different. What is driving is a top down. It's not that I look, what do I have? Oh, I have a data file. Let me process it. I say, okay, first, I need to know who are all the employees in it. Next, I need working day. Uh, so get working dates for dates where so one thing immediately becomes obvious supposing for some reason it failed and i did not uh, it did not run on one working date okay by saying that get working date should return all dates which are working dates for which attendance has not yet been updated my program immediately becomes more robust because now if this is not run on a particular date, maybe the cron job failed, something happened, your, your schedule did, or it was somebody had to manually press a button or run a script and that person was absent and he didn't run it. By saying that, get the dates for which working dates, for which the attendance has not yet been updated, it becomes a little more robust. Second problem, which is not so obvious when you are doing it uh, bottom up is that you will only be updating the attendance records for people who swiped in that day. It may not be obvious when we look at it like that. When we look at it top down, it becomes um, Supposing three people didn't attend, what does this approach do? Because you are scanning the data file. So those three people won't have any records there. And you're not going to be processing uh, those employees at all. So they will have, they will not have a record for that date. 
because they were not present in that date. Whereas when you start writing it down like this, I have to update in more employees. Okay, I have to get all employee information. Here now suddenly you are processing all employees. So all employees will get a record. It is not only people who attended or who logged in on that day who get a record in their uh, database, which is a subtle bug which will get discovered sometime down the line, right? But and it will be solved. I am not saying that, but but this top-down approach immediately throws up two concepts which will immediately make our uh, product more robust, right? Then I will say, okay, and I need to update attendance information. There's an, I'll create an attendance updater object and say update attendance details, pass the collection of employee objects and pass the working dates, okay? So now I'm break, if you see, break the parts into parts. So I am taking this part, update attendance information, which is still vague, it has not yet been broken down. I take update attendance information and break it down to get scan information for the date and update employee attendance. Here, I break this into get scan information, update employee attendance, okay? I am not going further, but I am already writing code and this, when I go through this step, I write this attendance updater update without having this here, or I may create a dummy uh, object and dummy method for this. Okay. So now the attendance uh, updater up, uh, class is getting created, and the method which is update attendance details is written. So I know what I do. So I have to get scan for so working dates gives me a list of working dates for which I'm supposed to uh, do it. So for scan date and working dates, scan info is equal to scan timestamp file, which is actually this same same um, function. It's not that the function which you write is uh, different. It's just that it is organized differently. So this function is the same as the function we came up with when we were doing the bottom up. And this was the first function we came up with. And we're going to use the same function. It'll return the same thing. It'll give you uh, employee IDs and the list of scan, um, the list of uh, timestamps. Then <coughs> I, the collection of employees, it's already a set of objects. So then I say update employee attendance. I'm not bothered here. I will say later I need to write an update employee method for this attendance updater class, which will accept a scan date, the each individual employee now, and the scan info for that particular uh, employee. And now I say, okay, so this was update employee attendance. Now I'm breaking that into parts and that has only one for the backup called calculate attendance based on employee type. And this is where a top down uh, shines, especially if you are uh, object oriented junkie, right? Because, oh, based on employee type, this sounds like a tip typical fact which I can do. I, I will need to calculate attendance for different employee types. I should probably get an attendance calculator from a factory and do that, right? So I have found when I am working with people and telling them, please break a problem into parts. And whenever I see statement like this based on something, why don't we make it a factory and have a set of uh, attendance calculators, right? So yeah, seems to fit in very easily, okay? So attendance calculator, I use an attendance calculator factory, which returns an attendance calculator. And I calculate the attendance by just passing the 
crawl by uh, passing i mean sorry crawling calculate attendance with the scan info and the employee object i get that in its information and then for this particular employee objects i write down the attendance into the database by saying okay for this candidate this is the attendance info for this particular employee please update okay so attendance calculator factory very simple if this is the grade range of the grade and department is s i return a salesman attendance calculator uh, if he is not if he is a employee in some other department i um, return senior management sorry this is if he is a senior management if he is in a different range if he is in grade 1 to 4 and his department is not s the default attendance calculator is what gets returned okay if i am handling all the special cases now if he is a sales person i have this if he is a senior manager his attendance calculator is different if he is a top manager his top manager my attendance calculator is different okay and this is what the default attendance calculator looks like because here are uh, same thing right get uh, information get in office duration for uh, scan I, i have skipped a step here that you know the um, this time stamp to duration i have not shown it but i assume that the time stamp to duration is um, uh, done here right into the uh, i'm sorry it's just a mistake that i made so um, i need only the get in office duration i do that i return the attendance if it's a salesman it's a slightly different flow if it is this it's slightly different if it is top management it's slightly different and uh, the employee object is more or less the same except now the data access layer and the business logic layer has been cleanly separated right this top down approach tends to force you to uh, separate uh, the business or uh, layer and i mean the business calculation layer and the sales well layer right so this is basically what we are saying that in the top down approach you first write down the what you are going to do i'm going to update address information for employees for working days then i will get employee information get working dates update this thing so the structure of the code follows this very closely structure of your code follows very closely the sentences that you write and by doing this very often people uh, i have worked with a lot of people and uh, i have trained almost every team that i work with i will conduct um, a top down versus bottom up approach session for them and if this uh, my personal experience is that the top down approach tends to favor slightly more modular and better structured code so i'll stop here and kind of wait for comments because um we've gone through two examples and i, I would like the impression people have that what is top down very hard to do is bottom up easier to do is top down resulting in better structured code what what is the feedback from you people top down is well thought through bottom mm. up is without much thought we start coding and move on right yeah that that is that, yeah that, that's that's kind of you know the process itself forces you to think through if, if i can say that right the process itself forces you to think through the problem before you start coding and uh, very nice of you have to have caught that 
because with the bottom up approach mm, there's nothing in the process um which says look sit and think about what you're going to do holistically before you start coding right whereas the top down approach if you insist that that's what i insist that look if you're writing a module if you're writing a module i want your uh, sentences we, we call i call this the sentences of what you're going to do as comments in the top of the file right i want you to write down what it is that you're going to do here and that forces them and i say i want to see that comments and you know i want to see that comments in that file and until i see the comments and you discuss it with me don't start coding especially for beginners right or, or people who are uh, just uh, coming on board and things like that if they are just starting programming i don't start this from day one my my experience is if you start this from day one uh they have not yet worked so I, i let them start bottom up which is kind of the default way that we are taught in college the default way that most people ask you to approach um tdd uh, sprints all of this tends to say okay boss this is what i want this, this is my um, definition of done for this um, sprint and please get this done right so in sprints we say this is this the output which i want and this is the definition of done for that i want code which does this so i i will say i want code which updates at a time right? people tend to fall into that uh, i let them at least 3 months i let them go through that process and find bugs realize there are bugs and um let that go through right and then i start telling them look you need to think before you code and people just said i i definitely think before coding sir but then what i do is i implement a process okay if you're thinking before coding please write down your thinking in this structure as it this is no complicated structure right it it's just a hierarchical um, structure which any you can do it in any text editor without a problem just do this hierarchical structure and show me i'll say this is what i have thought about it then you know many often i'll say okay what it happens is okay have you thought about working days or are you going to do it for all days what are you what are you actually planning to do and then oh yeah okay working days uh, sometimes you know th- this may not be there at all so there's say get employee information update attendance information that that is the first thing but then um, as you know the product owner or the product manager you can start saying no you have not thought of this you not thought of this and that initial interaction helps eliminate a lot of bugs uh, and a lot of rework i mean rework is the most expensive thing right if you do a good design up front it really helps so th- th- this is what we are doing so any thoughts comments on this so i think one factor in this is how clear is the problem definition to start with because sometimes right. i mean uh, i think we at least in my experience it's like we end up doing a combination of these two mm-hmm. because many times you're discovering things as well right right so, Absolutely. I think in this example, you had a clear, uh, let's say, objective, mm-hmm. and then you approach it top down and say, okay, this is what I need to do. Hence, it classifies into these three, which mm-hmm. further classify into say these nine or whatever, mm-hmm. something like that. Right? right, right, right. But in reality, like I mean, it's sometimes I think it's a mix that, you know, probably works mm-hmm. more sometimes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, valid, valid, valid. I mean, I understand that. Um, uh, as um we discussed right it's not that what is happening in the bottom up is missing from here the functions many very often the functions which are being written are the same it just says like ask me 
get scan information. That, that's the, the probably the same thing if you were doing bottom up, uh, you you do. And I un, very valid point that you've written uh, raised. What if the requirement is unclear, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so and this has happened, right? Look, I, I want to achieve something. I, I'm, I'm not even sure what I want to achieve, right? Huh? So what am I going to do in the first pass? Write down what you're going to do in your first pass. What are you going to, uh, if you say, I, I don't know whether this is going to work, whether I'm very sure, okay? Write down your first pass and create a prototype and show it to the person and say, is this what you want? He says, no. So um, uh, you can write a lot of, uh, it may, this structure makes it easy to write dummy code, right? Stubbed out code, which returns some mm, hard coded values and which you say later, I, I will like, for example, scan file info, right? I could, in, in this typical situation, it's, it's very uh, easy to say, that scan temp files, temp, I, I don't even have the file. I don't have the file with me. I will just, whatever, when I write this function, I'll make sure that the signature, it returns this signature. I can write scan timestamp file as a dummy file. I said, I don't know what the file, I don't know what the file format is. So the uh, person will say, look, uh, what is the file format? Right now I've given you a clean scan file uh, information, right? Maybe it's not known. Uh, we don't know. There's some employee and timestamp is coming. That's all. I don't know what is the thing. Okay. Until we know what it is, I will write a dummy function here, which is stub, which returns some hard coded dictionary, right? And say, yeah, the rest of the thing is work. The rest of the thing is working. I, I don't know what it is. And if later on, uh, there are going to be multiple formats for this. I can just make it a factory again, which decides, okay, if this is the format of the timestamp file, use this, but you know, they all have to return information in this format, right? So uh, I have been through the situation which you're discussing where, you know, some things are unknown. And usually I say, let, let's say we don't know. Okay, so just stub it out or write it out and get the rest of the code working. And uh, when we know the file format, we'll work on that. And so tomorrow, if there are multiple file formats, yeah, just encapsulate that into that scan information, make a scan object, and you know, create factory which returns that um, method and um, use that. Anybody else? Have anything to say about this approach? So one comment about the top down. Uh, so here you have presented a hierarchical structure of statements. Right. And uh, is it fair to say that this leads to the role of a software architect? Because a software architect would naturally take a top down approach. He would look right. at try to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. And they may do more than, uh, you know, uh, write these sentences. They will look at right. the diagrams, class diagrams, yeah, interaction yeah. diagrams, and so on. Yeah. Well, uh, I agree with you. I, I think the architect role is more complex. The, the way, you know, one of, um, there's a fascinating article. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know where I, I have it um, squirreled away somewhere. I, I store a lot of articles where um, the key point made was that software de development is designed all the way down to the person writing the code. Because it's not that, you know, a beginner who's joined your team is writing some code. Uh, he is likely to be introducing tech debt into your system because of wrong design, right? And uh, just compare a car factory to a software development center, right? 
in a car factory somebody does design and somebody does manufacture right but software is not like that there is no break up between uh, an architect does architecture a designer does design and somebody manufactures code right it is it is continuous right down to the person who is writing the code his design he is also designing code so it's very hard to draw a line and uh, that is kind of uh, which is why you know break the problem into parts and then break the parts into parts so an architect may have been looking at uh, the overall payroll system right and he assigned one team member uh, he broke it into parts and he says look this is one part i want a attendance system which takes care of uh, my attendance system and does that so if you look at this uh, and look at it from the architect who is looking at the overall product who is looking at non functional requirements and things like that he is also breaking it up into parts and for an architect it is kind of mandatory you can't do bottom up architecture is very hard to do bottom up architecture but the top down approach means that even the architect gives what he considers one small module to uh, a programmer i i would say uh, i will use the word programmer a programmer can muck it up he can introduce a lot of tech debt into the system um, and it's hard to blame him because th there's no way he's encouraged to think think the problem through before starting coding and this kind of statement if i take it back to the architect right Uh, supposing the first attempt was update attendance information for employees get employee information attend, update and i can even look at it you know I, i thought it would be for working days why is working days not there in the statements that you wrote right so it improves the uh, dialogue between the architect and the mm, this person okay and I mean that's that's the way I have experienced it, right? Yeah. And, uh, that as as usual, uh, the big headache that all <laughs> software guys face: change request. Hey, somebody somebody says, "Oh no no, now we have a new customer. Uh, he doesn't have the same employee working days for all employee. Each employee employee has a list of working days stored against his ID." Oh okay. Uh, people are. when people log in on non working days uh, they are very you know forward looking and we will give you a compensatory off for the employee okay as soon as these kinds of changes come in in the top down approach and bottom up approach it, it re- has a completely different impact right because when i do it did the bottom up approach i think even think about the possibility oh okay okay now uh, how do i do this whereas if we look at the top down approach i just need to go here right here what i said i said there's only working dates and working date is independent of employee right now what happens is this working dates is no longer independent of employee so i can't calculate working dates here i say get employee information and update uh, for uh, the working dates so what happens all i need to do is flip this around here i will loop through the employees and for each employee i will get the list of working days so these loops will just flip i just loop over employees and from the employee i will get the scan date and then loop through the scan dates and do the same thing this 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 function has not changed at all just the loops are flipped around here and i need a get working days for employee um 
method in my employee lists. Uh, list. This is one of the benefits of having done drop down, I mean, top down, which I see, which is really a big help. When your thought is through like that, you can easily isolate and make a change. And for implementing this change request, okay, I, I mean, I'll be sharing this. You can see that the only change required is here. I just have to flip these loops. Uh, <clears throat> this code does not change. This code does not change. Everything else works as, as it is, no problem. Let's look at the next change, right? Non-working days, um, I should update compensatory off for the employees. So what happens there? Again, because of the way it is structured, what will happen is in this, I will get um, working days and I will also check whether an employee, so instead of, I, I would then have update employee attendance and also call update employee compensatory off. I would only pass in scan dates, which are non-working dates for that. Okay, so I'd write a parallel um, function, I mean a method, update employee attendance, update employee uh, compensatory off. And here I will pass in scan dates, which are working dates. Here next uh, case, I will only pass in scan dates, which are non-working dates. Okay, so and the update employee attendance and the update employee compensatory off. If the compensatory off, no, if you're above grade three, there is no compensatory off. Some complicated rules are there. I just have a compensatory off, um, off calculator factory. I just write it and I um, I will have an e write attendance. I'll have an e dot write compensatory off. Right. So this, this kind of changes fit in very well without having to do major rewrites. And both these would be very, as, as we already pointed out, there are some already some bugs which came in the first way um, because all employees are not getting updated. We are assuming that it will only be run on a working date. So then some changes, it's not that it is impossible in that, but my experience shows it's easier if you've taken the top-down approach. Okay, and that's the end of my session, except for some further reading that I am recommending. So this difference between bottom-up and top-down, this is how I have always been thinking about it. Uh, recently, I read a book called A Philosophy of Software Design called John House by a person called John Austerhout. I recommend it strong. If you found this session interesting, I strongly recommend you read this book. He calls it tactical versus strategic programming. He says tactical programming means I just jump in and solve the problem, right? Strategic pro programming is I think about the structure, uh, how am I going to structure the code and then start program, right? So interesting book, some uh, key lessons which I found, <sighs> complexity has costs, change amplification. What he means is that um, whenever I have to make a change and I make one more change, it increases the complexity and the number of things uh, that I have to do changes, right? And he talks about cognitive load, which is an interesting way of looking at it. We, we call it tech debt, okay? We tend to call it uh, tech debt, but uh, he calls, uh, Osterhout calls it cognitive load. He's saying that, you know, the cognitive load on an, um, when there is complexity, the cognitive load increases and that is, why impact analysis is so hard because you have to keep many things in your mind and people know that you know if you have to keep many things in your mind 
you tend to miss out something or you forget something cognitive load increases there are unknown unknowns when there are i, I don't know it's so complex I, I don't know what's what has to be done i don't know how it's going to be this thing so he lists down reasons for complexity he says dependencies dependencies of course are the, the ways for um, we, we can't live without dependencies in software but he says dependency design correctly designing the um, dependencies is a key factor which which he does with something which he calls deep models which we will discuss obscurity because when i look at the code it's not obvious what i should be doing right and if i want to make some change it's not obvious hopefully the person has written comments which helps me to understand so a lot of things are obscure right and complexity every time you come there and somehow patch the code the complexity is ballooning right it is just ballooning till it becomes unmanageable so he says the key is to create what he calls deep modules where the interface is simple he, he uses a very simple analogy what he says is the complexity think of every module as a triangle okay the width of the triangle is how complicated the interface is that is how complex is the abstraction that you made the height of that um, rectangle is how much functionality is written into that particular module. Module could be a class, it could be a file. Um, he, he's talking generically, he's not talking specifically about uh, any particular um, software programming language, you know, uh, object or paradigm like object oriented or functional. Or not. He's saying, I have a module. I don't know what a module means in your language, but how simple is the abstraction or interface and how powerful is the, this thing? So he says deep modules where the height to width ratio is high. You should try to improve the height to width ratio so that it, this he says, reduces cognitive load. The interface is simple. So another programmer who joins your group can use this module with low cognitive load so he says pull complexity into implementation he said i mean he basically here what he's saying is uh, many things which are for example let, let's take a practical example from our example which we have worked with now Supposing I say, look, uh, one of the things that you have to pass in as a parameter is the format of the scan file, right? If there are going to be four different scan files, I'm going to have a factory which returns a method, which uh, uh, object which will handle different scan files. And you expect the programmer to pass in what is the Format of the scan file that you win. That seems like a very reasonable expectation. He says, don't do it. He says, you inspect the scan file and then decide, oh, this is the factory I have to return, right? Don't put this cognitive load on the person who's going to use your module. There's a diff. He said, this is what he means by height and width, right? If I in my interface, I have to pass in what is the format of the scan file which you are going to uh, process. The width has increased. Whereas if that information doesn't need to be passed in the information, the code within your module will inspect the scan file and decide, oh, this is this format. I can discover it, right? And now that increases the depth and reduces the width. That's what he says, pull complexity into the imp implementation, increase the functionality, write more code, doesn't matter, but make the interface simple. Define errors out of existence. What he means is, I doesn't care whether you are passing an error back or you have a try catch this thing. He says, 
try to uh, for example he says uh, uh, the example he gives is a very simple one he says look if uh, the user says uh, and he takes many examples from the unix so file handling system he says supposing the user says i want to read the next thousand bytes of the file into the buffer um, if there are only 300 bytes no error will be raised it will just return 300 bytes this is all there is right don't um, raise these errors as well as well say that this this is all i will get you as much as possible right so an interesting book i i i'm just you know in very very uh, simple things it's an excellent book uh, if you found this session interesting i'm sure you'll find this book and Thank you. Uh, see you next time. Please. I'm doing something. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm now open to questions, feedback. Thank you, GK. Wonderful session. Any questions from others? So I have a very particular question. Hmm. Suppose I have a method or function which is, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, up, supposed to update a particular record for a given ID. Right. Let's say it's a user ID or something which is passed into the function. Right. Now there is a business logic that if the user ID is zero, and that means mm -hmm. it's not an existent user. Mm -hmm. So no update is required. Right. So the function is called update user. Right. Now there are two approaches. Uh, you know, when you enter the function, immediately you check whether the ID is zero, and if so, right. you return. Right. The other approach is you pass this responsibility to the caller. Caller is supposed to check for a non-zero ID and only then call the update function. Right. So, what is the general practice or recommended practice in the industry to tackle this? Uh, you know, just taking this deep modules. Um, concept right in the deep modules concept that would be handled not by the caller but by the module which is doing the update right uh, the, the the that is the default answer i have right but uh, after a lot of hard burn and uh, hidden errors with this approach okay this this results in what I call as um, difficult to discover bugs. Okay. Supposing I say that the caller has to uh, handle this error, it means that the caller will know hey, why on earth have I got an empty ID here? Okay. And you, I should raise an error. I am not expecting an empty ID. And hence, uh, I uh, know there is an error. Uh, did the caller expect me to handle this? So, if this silently swallows the fact, I mean, the module silently swallows the fact that uh, a zero ID came in, you may never know that some code has some problem. It should only be passing in valid IDs, but for some obscure combination of data, I mean, combination of parameters and settings and data, it is passing a zero. So what I tend to follow and recommend for this is, look, handle it. Don't do anything. Don't raise an error. Just say, but log it. But log it and put in as much information. If, you know, the employee ID came empty and some other data came in, log it saying that this function was called with a zero id and with this data okay log it and say this is a um, i mean it, it should be logged in at um, a very high priority right so if you if you have, ha have a prioritized logging system this this should be written to the log every time that is how I would handle this. Make sense to you, Arvind? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Thank you. All right.